All right, chapter five. Let's get started on the revolution. How do we get to become the United States? Uh, so, of course, I know you've already read the chapter, right? Um, and I want to warn you here that, that when I was first learning American history, this was the period that really got me fired up uh, about history. So if I get a little bit too uh, crazy, you'll understand. Uh, so I want to start by going back to 1763, right? It's the, the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, and England emerges from, from that war kind of the way America emerges from World War II, right? Uh, you know, England is victorious. It's united. It's the undisputed superpower of the world. Uh, and no one on either side of the Atlantic could imagine that, uh, that one day that empire would fall apart and that the colonies would become a free and independent nation. And yet, just 20 years later, that's exactly what happens. So how? How does that happen? Well, you know, if you're the British Empire, you're like, how the hell did we let that happen? That's what I want to talk about today. And so again, let's go back to 1763. We talked about this in class, but but uh, it's really important to understand the effects of the, the Seven Years' War. Right? The Treaty of Paris ends the war. England wins big. Right? France is kicked out. Uh, you know, gives up all claims to to land in North America. Spain gives up Spanish Florida, although France does give Spain the uh, all the land west of the Mississippi. And, and this is, I mean, this is pure, unmitigated victory, right? And, and the victory expands the colonists' sense of possibility, right? They have much higher expectations now, uh, post-1763, right? Now that the French are gone, colonists expect life to get much better, right? Lower taxes now that the war is over, more opportunity to settle west because these, then, you know, the French forts are being abandoned. They expect better treatment from the British government because we just, we just fought uh, seven years worth of war uh, on our continent, um, and so so they have very high expectations. But the end of the war brings more trouble. Uh, you read about uh, the trouble on the on the, in the back country, which is which is starting to seem now like the frontier. We don't start using that term just yet, but but it's this idea that now that the French are gone, there's all this opportunity out west to to settle the lands. But the Indians, who had been allied with the French, primarily, almost all, all the tribes had been allied with the French, not all of them, but almost, uh, they get worried, right? Because they just lost their ally. The Indians had been playing the two empires off from e off of each other for, for some time, rather effectively. Uh, you read about Pontiac's revolt, where, where he tries to bring tribes together to, to resist English encroachment. And for the British... Pontiac's revolt and, and and other trouble on the on the border, you know, on the western border, just makes them more war weary, right? They they just fought this tremendous war. They don't want to keep fighting skirmishes, so they they draw that proclamation of 1763, say no more, you know, can't can't settle beyond there, uh, and you know they're trying to prevent conflicts with the Indians. They're also trying to exert control over the colonists, right? They feel like. The colonists have have not been uh, have not been the best subjects, right? You know, the the war has has made many British officials be uh, very frustrated with the with the colonists. They think that the the colonists didn't do their share during the war, right? They think that the colonists uh, the colonial governments were too stingy, didn't didn't pay their share. Uh, there were accusations that the col colonial soldiers hadn't fought very well, that they fought poorly, and they were, they were worried that the colonists were just out there creating more problems, especially on the, on the border with the Indians, but there was this, this growing sense of frustration on the part of British authorities in the sense that we need to rein these colonies in, right? They're, they're getting a little bit too uh, above themselves. And there's also the practical issue that the war has, has thrown the British government deeply into debt. Right? They're in tremendous debt, and so they need to find, the British authorities need to find more revenue. And they want more revenue from the colonies, because from the British perspective, they just expended lots of money, sent many soldiers to their deaths, fighting to protect uh, the colonists, among other things, of course, back in Britain. But, but they feel that, that the colonists should be grateful for the protection that the, that the British army gave them. And so... 1764, 1765, what you see is, is the British government seeking to assert its control over, over the colonies, especially 
through revenue. They, they need more revenue, and they're going to say, you have to pay up. Right? It starts with the Sugar Act in 1764. Right, It, it forces a, a new duty on, on molasses imported for the Caribbean. But as, as Foner shows, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of, in some ways, a tax decrease, but the enforcement is, is ratcheted up. So colonists feel like, look, we were getting this stuff for free. Uh, before, because we could just smuggle it in, but now you're you're forcing us to pay this this duty, so they start to get a little bit upset with that, and and then there's one after another throughout 1764 and early 1765, Parliament continues to pass these laws that are intended to to raise revenue and, and keep the colonists under control. You got the Currency Act, you, you also get the Quartering Act, which I don't think Foner mentions, but but the colonists have to provide British troops with, with suitable accommodations. Um, so all of these things start to, to stoke some anger among the, the colonists, but they it doesn't really boil over until the Stamp Act, right? And the Stamp Act really starts to spur American resistance in a way that's unusual and, and, and unprecedented. In, and again, you have to see it as sort of the last straw, right? This wasn't, it wasn't just the Stamp Act. It was the Sugar Act and the Currency Act and the Revenue Act and the Quarter. It was all this stuff. And then, bang, here comes the Stamp Act. And, and Foner talks about how this in, inspired resistance among all people, you know, people of all social classes, all, all free men, um, but especially the articulate class, right? Because it was a stamp on anything with paper. Uh, so, so all their pamphlets and newspapers, like all their letters, all that stuff had to be, had to be stamped and, and was therefore subject to taxation. And so, so you start to get people really articulating uh, opposition to this. And I mean, what makes them so mad is that it makes them feel, it makes the colonists feel that, that they're not really full British citizens, that they, they don't have the same rights as the, the, the people that they were fighting with just a few years ago, right? They thought that the war, if nothing else, had established them, the colonists, as full British, uh, British subjects uh, and full British citizens, and that means having access to full British liberties. And they felt like they weren't, they, they didn't have the representation in Parliament, and therefore they were being taxed without their consent. Right, and so it it's it's an infringement of liberty. It's 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 both insulting uh, and and also something that that shows just once again that they are not full subjects of the British Crown. And and so as they start to articulate their opposition to the Stamp Act, they're really drawing upon uh, John Locke, right, who had, who had written that the power to ta tax is the power to destroy. Right, it's a very uh, it, it's a par very powerful tool of government. I mean, it's a, it can be a weapon of government. And that's why the, you, no people should be taxed without their consent. Well, if the American colonists don't have represent representation in Parliament, they're being taxed without their consent. And so they see the taxes as, as illegitimate. And what, what happens is they start to come together. I mean, this is what makes the, the Stamp Act crisis so, so different, what, what makes it in some ways, a, a trigger for the for the revolution a decade later, um, because what starts to happen is you, you you start to see this development of an of an American identity, right? Bef you know, before seventeen sixty three, uh, before the Stamp Act crisis, uh, American colonists tended to see themselves as as Virginians or or, or Bostonians, even you know, or, you know, Pennsylvanians. They didn't see themselves as Americans. They were they were separated. It was very hard both because of, of, of ideology and practical considerations, it's very hard to get the, the colonists to unite on, on anything. But the Stamp Act engenders this, this organized collective resistance. And you get the Stamp Act Congress, where, where delegates from most of the colonies come together to, to petition the king to repeal the, the act. I mean, this is, this is highly unusual. Uh, you get these resistance groups calling themselves the Sons of Liberty, right? And Foner talks about how liberty becomes this, this, this buzzword, this watchword. This is, this is what it's all about, right? It's all about liberty. You're infringing on our liberty by making us pay taxes that we don't have a chance to, to, to vote on or, or, or to, to, to discuss. And the resistance is successful. The king backs down rather quickly. I mean, within a year, the Stamp Act uh, is repealed. But... Just because they repealed the Stamp Act doesn't mean that things have changed. 
right? Before I go on, I mean, that, that's going to be question one for your homework is to, to explain, to, to answer this. Almost every colonist, including that guy Thomas Hutchison, who uh, you know, was burned in effigy at the, at the beginning of the, of the chapter, um, and, and who later became a loyalist, he was loyal to the British government, but almost every colonist opposes the Stamp Act. So I want you to explain why colonists expo uh, oppose the Stamp Act and identify the ways in which they saw the Stamp Act as a threat to their, their, their freedom. So there's the question. Explain why the colonists opposed the Stamp Act and, and the, explain how they saw the Stamp Act as a threat to their freedoms. So, again, getting back to the story here, you know, just because this, the, the king has repealed the Stamp Act doesn't mean that the crisis is over, or, and it doesn't mean that Parliament has, has changed it, its uh, tune at all, right? Parliament still thinks the colonists are out of control. Parliament still thinks that the colonists need to pay their fair share. Colonists still want to raise revenue from, from the the colonies. So, yes, we repeal the Stamp Act, but now we're going to pass a series of laws to, to try to bring revenue in in other ways. Okay, maybe we don't do a, a tax on paper, but maybe paint and glass and tea and all these other things. Uh, these were all collectively called the Townshend Act, uh, uh, Townshend Acts after Charles Townshend, the, the finance minister, basically, the Britain's Chancellor of the Exchequer. And so what, what these acts do is they, they inspire more resistance, right? You know, I mean, the Stamp Act was bad enough, but once the king repealed that, that law, the, the resistance kind of died down, the son's liberty sort of fade away, but the, the Townshend Acts bring him back into, into being, right? And this is where you get the, the boycotts of British goods. You know, Foner talks about the, the homespun virtue, right? You know, the, you know, women back at home, you know, spinning their own clothes um, instead of importing the, the goods from, from England. And so this, this, again, inspires all kinds of resistance. You see it in the streets, right? The Sons of Liberty are, you know, they're not writing pamphlets. They're out there hanging people in effigy. They're, they're throwing rocks at, at uh, tax collectors' homes. Um, they, and, and this is what, it's this kind of uh, resistance that leads to the, the quote-unquote Boston Massacre. We're going we're gonna to talk a lot about that in, in class, but... but um, it's really a guy named Samuel Adams. You know, Samuel Adams, now we remember him as a, as a beer man. Um, but, I mean, it, you know, because he didn't become president and do all these other things later on, we sort of forget about the, the role that he played. I mean, he played a tremendous role in, in fomenting the, the resistance to, to, uh, to British laws and to British authorities in, in America. So he becomes a, a, a leading figure in, in Boston and in, in sort of organizing resistance to, to British forces who are intent on enforcing these new new tax laws. He's a, a leader of the Massachusetts Assembly, and he's, he, he's really one of the first guys, one of the first people in, in America to foresee an eventual break with the British Empire. Again, at this time, you know, people are starting to see themselves as Americans who have, have certain interests that they share together, uh, as opposed to... to folks back in Britain, but there's no sense, really no widespread sense that, oh, this means we have to break apart and become our own country, right? This only starts to develop, you know, men like Samuel Adams are starting to, to broach these ideas, but even in the 1770s, it's not widespread. In the early 1770s, folks aren't ready to make that, that break yet. Uh, but Adams starts to organize protests against the, the, the British soldiers. It's during one of these, these clashes. You get you know, kids throwing snowballs, guys throwing snowballs. You know, there's all sorts of uh, mayhem going on. Something happens. Someone shouts fire. British soldiers open fire on, on uh, a, a crowd of, of, of citizens, American citizens. Five lay dead. All right? and, and this becomes a, a, catalog, you know, a catalyst for 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 the colonists, you know, for the for the resistance leaders, because uh, they you know, they can't believe that that they've just been fired upon, right? So five people dead, right? In in, in terms of historical massacres, uh, compared to what the the colonists have been doing to <laughs> to Indians uh, over the years, I mean, it's a very small a small uh, event, but it it's a it's a it's a turning point. It's it's a key point for for the colonists who are enraged 
Um, and, you know, again, Parliament, the, the Crown, they kind of back down, and they, they, they repeal all the Townshend Acts, except for the one on T, right? And that dissipates some of the... Uh, some of the the momentum, right? But but Samuel Adams wants to keep the fires burning, right? He doesn't want the 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 resistance to to die out because again, he's seeing that that eventually the Americans are going to want to have their own country. So he sets up what are, what are called the committees of correspondence, and basically what he's trying to do is is just keep people in touch with each other. I mean, this is the the era long before before the internet and and Facebook and Twitter and all these ways that we can keep connected uh, no matter where we are in the world. Uh, this is before telephone and television, right? So he's he's got to find ways to keep people informed about what's going on, uh, to keep people motivated, to keep uh, resisting, and he he distributes pamphlets. He solicits input from all the other colonies. He's trying to keep these folks together, and it's this tax on tea that that eventually becomes the the, the next triggering point because the colonists still don't believe that Parliament has a legitimate right to tax them uh, no, on anything, no, you know, no matter how big or small, because it's there's there's a principle involved, right? That that. Because we don't have representation in Congress, in, in Parliament, we shouldn't have to pay those taxes. And and so after the, the Parliament passes the, the Tea Act to help bail out an English tea company, right? Colonial leaders say, no, no, wait, we're we're gonna we're gonna refuse all the cargoes. We're gonna we're gonna turn back all the tea all the tea that's coming uh, into our harbors. And December 16th, 1773. Uh, a group of uh, several dozen colonists dressed as Indians. In, I, ironic twist there, because the Indians, you know, were were sort of in some ways the the embodiment of, of full freedom. Right? We, we, we've talked about the 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 different ways that the colonists view, viewed Indians. Um, they they protest on the streets in in Boston um, and or oh, during the day, and then at at night they dress up as Indians and and jump on some British tea ships, dump all this tea into the harbor. Uh, Foner says about $4 million <laughs> worth of tea. I mean, tea is everywhere. I, mean, I guess we drink coffee much more nowadays, but in this time, everybody's drinking tea. Um, and this this puts, pushes Parliament too far. It's like before the resistance... Had, had led Parliament and the, the king to back down and say, okay, you know, we'll, 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 we'll repeal that act or whatever. But now this really pisses Parliament off. You're just like, wait a minute. Uh, I mean, first of all, a lot of Parliament, members of Parliament themselves are investors in the tea company. Uh, so, so they're hit. Uh, but, but also it's, it's, it's insulting to the crown, right? I mean, here are these British subjects um, who are attacking British ships, basically. And so uh, Parliament decides to, to isolate Boston, to, to punish Boston through, through these coercive acts, a, a set of, of, uh, of laws that are targeted at Boston. And, and basically, you know, they close Boston Harbor um, indefinitely. British officials take over governance of the colony. Um, the British require that their soldiers are to be quartered in uninhabited homes. And, and they, they do this to, to punish the leaders of the, the resistance movement. Um, and and really break the spine uh, of the resistance. But what it does is it, it does the opposite. It has the opposite effect. I mean, it infuriates the colonists even more than, than the Stamp Act did, right? Because here they're, they're singling out and, and kind, of, kind of ganging up on this, this one colony, this one city even. Um, and so colonists call the acts the intolerable acts, the, you know, the coercive acts. And, and these acts, what they do is they, they seem to confirm all the colonists' worst suspicions about the British government, right? I mean, the, the colonists think that that the British government, you know, in their words, would, it wants to enslave us, right? It want, wants to force us to, to do things that are illegitimate. And so what happens in the wake of the Intolerable Acts is that the, it, it inspires resistance all across the colonies and collective efforts all across across the colonies that's eventually going to going to explode into into war in 1775 and so what happens is you get you get colonists coming together and the you have the first continental congress in in 1774 people come uh, it's col the colonies send delegates to to philadelphia to kind of talk about how uh how to respond 
man, you know, Samuel Adams is there representing Massachusetts, and he's there. He's he's one of the only ones. He's he's kind of the radical guy out there saying we need to break with England. This is it. You know, we can't tolerate this anymore. We need to become our own country. But most most folks aren't going to go go that far. Uh, and so the Continental Congress, the first Continental Congress, calls for a boycott of, of trade with Britain until the coercive acts are, are repealed. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't begin preparing for any kind of war. It, it doesn't want to go that, that far. But during the winter of 1774, early spring 1775, tensions are, are increasing, right? The revolutionaries are, are, are trying to enforce the boycott on themselves, right, you know, on, on, on other colonists. Um, and they start setting up alternative uh, an alternative government, um, such as the Provincial Congress in Massachusetts, right? Because it's like, okay, if the British Crown is going to try to claim that it has authority to disband our, our assemblies, we're just going to create an alternative government. Uh, and the governor of Massachusetts feels compelled to, to take a stand against this, right? I mean, he can't have his subjects uh, just, just going off and forming their own government, right? I mean, that's, that's treason. And so he sends forces out to 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 basically break up this this new government and break break up the resistance. Um, and that that's where you get you know, the whole story. The British are coming, right? And you get Paul Revere, William Dawes, other folks going out to 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 warn the colonists. And and um, you know, shot rings out in, in Lexington, Massachusetts, and bang, it's the shot heard around the world. Although that's not something that colonists said. That that's later. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and others start using that term, but but Samuel Adams hears the news and he says, "What a glorious morning is this! Right, this is it. This is what he's been waiting for because he knows that once once you start fighting, you're not going to fight for the status quo antebellum, right? You're not going to go back to the way things were. And yet, even after the shots are fired, even after Americans are killed and British soldiers are killed by Americans." They're not ready to go that far. July 1775, you get the you get the Second Continental Congress comes together and and they seek re reconciliation, right? They, they 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 give what's called the Olive Branch Petition, right? It it affirms American loyalty to the king, loyalty to the king, it it just asks him to disavow his, the policies of his ministers, right? Sort of appealing to the king over Parliament uh, and and his authorities in America to say. We're loyal to you. Please come to our our rescue. But they don't. But the king doesn't. And the Continental Congress kind of knows that the king is not going to at this point. And so, unlike the first Continental Congress, the second Continental Congress starts preparing for war, right? And and starts putting together the Continental Army. Um, and and appoint you know later appoints George Washington to be the commander of this army. Um, and now you start talking. Revolution. Now you're starting to talk about actually fighting a a war, um, you know, but even still, you you have a lot of a lot of folks who are kind of kind of torn. They were uh, a lot of folks who were loyalists or or Tories who who really feared American radicalism more than they feared the British. Right? They estimates vary. Maybe twenty percent of the population or so. Uh, they denounce talk of rebellion. They denounce the radicals like Samuel Adams. Uh, a lot of them have personal or professional ties back to England, um, and and many of them, particularly among the elites, they fear instability, right? They they fear the chaos of rebellion. They fear what what talks of talking about liberty and freedom, all this, what that's going to do to the lower classes, right? What kind of anarchy? What what kind of ideas are are the lower classes going to have now in the wake of all this revolution, right? So they fear that more than they fear. British authority. Uh, there's another group that's kind of in the middle, and that's the slaves, right? You, you read about Lord Dunmore's proclamation um, where he said he, in 1775 he'd give freedom to any any black slave who, who comes to his lines. And this inspires lots of people, hundreds and hundreds of slaves say, hey, you know, we're, if we're talking about liberty here, right? Nobody knows about liberty more than we do. Nobody wants it more than we do. And, and if you're going to give me freedom to fight for the British... Hell yeah, I'm going over over to that side, um, but by and large, the, the British aren't aren't willing to go there themselves. You know, the British government isn't willing to emancip emancipate slaves, or uh, certainly not in the Caribbean, um, and they they don't want to go down that road either. And so, 
they you know, they're hoping to reconcile with southern whites whom they, whom they recognize as being tremendously powerful um, and so there isn't widespread em em emancipation and and you see you, George Washington offers freedom to, to slaves who join in his in his army as well you know so so slaves are trying to use this this war about liberty for their own benefit right trying to to, to find ways to, to secure their own freedom as these two powerful groups of whites are are fighting each other uh, and so what you see by 1775, 1776, more and more people are, are starting to conceive of a, of a very different future. Instead of a future where American colonists would have representation in, in Parliament and be full British subjects, they're starting to think, no, maybe we need our own country. And what finally pushes them over the edge is, is, a, is a radical paper by an Englishman, um, Thomas Paine, Common Sense, which we're going to talk about uh, in the in the next video, and com what common sense does is it, it it encapsulates the arguments for for independence, and and helps foster uh, this 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 powerful movement uh, toward independence that that culminates really in, in July 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we're going to talk more about, about pain in, in the next video. So the questions you need to answer, we, we, we talked about number one. Number two um, is, you know, how these, these grand ideas of freedom and, and liberty are, are contagious, right? And they're, they're often, they often spread rapidly beyond the, the, you know, the powers of any person or, or government's control. So I want you to answer this. Why were so many colonial elites uh, who held one definition of liberty alarmed by the actions and claims of average citizens in the decade before independence. Uh, I talked about it a little bit here, and, it's, and, it's, and there's more in the, in the book. Why were many colonial elites who held one definition of liberty alarmed by the actions and claims of average citizens in the decade before independence? Third question. Uh, to explain the British thought. Explain the British view of American colonists' complaints in the 1760s and 70s, right? How did the British view all this talk about, about liberty and freedom? Number four, Patrick Henry famously declared that, that he, he doesn't consider himself a Virginian, but rather an American, right? And so I want you to describe how a distinctly American identity developed between 1763 and 1776. How did we become American? Question number five will be on the on the common sense video, and that's where we'll go next.